evening or afternoon if you are Eastern Standard Time. Good evening to my European family. You are tuned in to WGSN DB Going Solo Network. And you are here with your girl, Davida Smith, on Living on Purpose Ministries. We welcome you back on tonight or today. And we are continuing on our miracle harvest. How do we prepare to receive our harvest? So on last time, when we all came together, we were continuing to talk about um, that as we look at time or as we look at the calendar, when was our jubilee? Remember, we said that jubilee is the day that we realize who God is in our lives. Hallelujah. So when we realize how awesome our God is, I wanted to start this this um, segment off today or this broadcast off today on a magnificent, great note by saying that our um, producer and our friend and our dear sister heart father is out. His surgery went well. He is responding well. We thank the Lord for the prayers of the righteous because they do avail as much. So all that have prayed for her and her family and her dad and her sister, we thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate everybody who who partners with me and who loves on me that joined in in the prayers for our sister CC and her dad. We thank you, thank you, thank you. His surgery went extremely well and we praise God for his recovering and his, his healing portion that he currently has right now. And we know there's more that has to be done, but we're just grateful, all right? We just wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you. We're grateful for the great report that he is doing well and back home. So even with that, remember we, let, we last said on um, the last time we came together, out of Mark 11, that we have to have the God kind of faith. And when we have the God kind of faith, the Bible says, when we say to the mountains and our lives, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and we do not doubt in our heart, the Bible says we can have whatsoever we say. So when we declared and decreed that he was healed by the blood and the virtue of Jesus that was running through his veins, look at God. So he gave us exactly what we said. So for that, we tell the Lord, thank you on today. And so as we continue on with our series, I left off telling you that our timing is short. Okay. We are in that part where time is winding up. The Bible says it this way, that we have to be careful or we have to look because the time of the Lord is at hand. And so when we look at that, we are we have to know that we're anointed for this particular time that we're in. We're still talking about our harvest, but we must remember we are anointed for the time that we are in. In. And the word anoint means to smear on, now check this out, smear on, rub in, immerse, or paint. I'm going to say that again. The word anoint means to smear on, rub in, immerse, or paint. So what is that saying? You and I have been rubbed in or we have been smeared on or we have been painted with the fragrance of which attracts the blessings and the free favors of God. Many will never understand the favor that you have on your life. OK, you may not realize it, but this is the year of favor. I remember when I was in my prayer every year. You know, as the year is getting ready to close out, I just kind of shut down and I get before God and I would never get God coming back and telling me um, out of, I think it's Revelations 3 and we'll go there later, but not now. But in Revelations, he says, I have put before you an open door. He says, it's a door that no man can shut and no man can open. If I open it, don't worry about it. They can't shut it. If I shut it, they can't open it. Glory be to God. So he said, this is the year of answered prayers and open doors. So this is the year of favor. It's the time for you to receive your harvest. 
Okay. One of the things I can say I am proud of, but it wasn't one of the most happiest times in my life. I remember coming into the military in the very early 90s, and we were in the middle of the Gulf War. Okay. I don't know if many of you remember that, but we were in the middle of the Gulf War. Okay. I had no idea when I left Fort Eustis, Virginia, right there in Newport News, Virginia, that when I left to go to my new duty station at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, that my first induction of being, excuse me, of being in the military was going to be, I was going to get to Bragg. Nobody told me that um, when I got to reception, that my first induction on the day of coming onto my new installation, I was going to have to run. It seemed like the whole length of Fort Bragg for a morning run and felt like my whole chest and my whole lung was going to fall out right there on Bragg Boulevard. And I got done with the run. And then a week into that craziness, I was sent to my new unit at full third transportation company right there on second street. And I remember it like it was yesterday and I linked up with everyone in my unit. I didn't get to meet my commander. I didn't get to meet my first sergeant because of, my entire unit was over in the desert. And the only people that were left back were people who had like profiles or couldn't deploy or things like that. So I met my detachment for sergeant and my detachment commander and the people that were left back in the rear was told, um, we're gonna give you enough time to, you know, get your things together and, you know, speak with your family, but you will be linked up and moving on forward with your unit. Y'all, my heart stopped pounding. <laughs> I was like, I'm getting ready to go where? <laughs> so here I am for like two weeks taking these pills, being told you need to take this, you need to take that shots every other day. And I'm getting prepped and I'm like scared out of my wits. Like, you got to be kidding me, right? This is not the welcome to the United States Army that I was looking for. So here I am getting ready to be linked into the Gulf War, which you got bombers, you got undetectable enemies and radars and different things and equipment with lasers and, and, and rockets and, and, and mortars and everything else going on over there. Okay. But what I understood was when we trace light, when we trace back who we are, when we trace back who and what God is, when we talk about laser, when we talk about um, bombs, when we talk about mortars, you know, one of the things that, you know, I remember when we was at the back, that international airport, even when we went to Iraq, what I realized about the enemy was, it seemed like every single day he was getting closer and closer to our camps. He was getting on target, like, like literally within so many meters from our tents, those things was dropping over and actually penetrating, hitting something. Okay. But just like we're smeared on or rubbed in or painted into the anointing of who God is in our lives. Do you not know God is right on target? God is right on track in your life. It doesn't matter how crazy and chaotic things can look at times, even though sometimes the enemy, uh -oh, the enemy looks like they're winning. The enemy looks like um, they got the upper hand because they're getting closer and closer. They, 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 they're doing more damage each and every time that they attack. That, you know, it looks like, you know, this time I'm going down with the flames, you know, I'm not going to make it out of this. Just when we think that we're like that, do you not know that the anointing, see, we said the anointing, the word anointing needs to smear on rub and immerse or to paint. Do you re not realize that there's so much anointing that's immersed or rubbed in or painted into your life? You know, God's, the Bible says, God knew us before the foundation 
of the world, meaning before he even put Davida Renee Smith in this earth realm, he knew exactly what I was going to need, how much anointing I was going to need applied to my life, how much pressure I could take, how much I would need that I knew I would snap or fold in or fold under. To me, that is so amazing to know that we serve a God that has tempered every single test and every single trial and every single situation that we will ever encounter. He thought about it. Before he got with he before he got Belvin Leon Smith Sr. in touch with Sharon Elizabeth Smith and they fell in love and got married and had me, he already knew when I was created, what I was created for, how long I would be here, how many lives I would impact. He knew everything. So when we think about that, he says, I'm going to draw a target on your life. I'm going to paint a big old bullseye on your back. Hallelujah. I'm going to draw that. I'm going to paint you so that when you're in the darkest place of your life, when you're in your midnight moment, the hour of my blessings will be able to find you. That's why Malachi said the blessings of God will overtake us. I told you this is the year of the open door and answered prayer. It's not a matter of of whether or not we're going to be blessed. No, we already have clarified over many lessons that we are already the blessed and the called of God. But not only that, let's look at that. Come on. I want us to be encouraged today. Let's jump over to Deuteronomy really quick. I want you to see this because this is going to bless you. We have to understand that we have been targeted. We have been set aside or set apart for God's use for whatever it is. I told you it could be that creative um, idea. It could be um, you. Maybe you're a barber or maybe a beautician and you don't even realize that God is setting you up. And sometimes it feels like all you're doing is paying booth rent or all you're doing is doing this and working for somebody else. And God may be preparing you for every business aspect. So every place he's put you, you've had to endure this or you've had to endure that. But all of it was life lessons. This is one of the things I love about my book. It has been so hard to come together. But what I've understood was every year, every situation, every setback, every disappointment, every whatever. Now I understand the title of my book, Pain with a Purpose. All of us go through some level of pain, but what we all don't realize is each pain has a purpose. It is to either drive out something, to put in something, or to work out something. Come on, I'm gonna say that again. It is to take out something, put in something, or work out something. Listen, it's going to work out some things within you or on you or with others. Sometimes we're used just for the slaughter. The Bible says we're for this, we're sheep for the slaughter. Listen, sometimes you are just to be the martyr so somebody else can see God in your life. Sometimes, um, you know, some of the things that God don't like that we have. Some of us had bad attitudes. Some of us were slowful. Some of us, you know, didn't always follow through. I had the spirit of procrastination. Come on, somebody. You know, some of the things that may be in us, he won't driven out. And then some of the things that's within us, he said, I want to keep that, but I want to, you know, make it more excellent. You know, so God has his way of pruning us and taking out or putting in or keeping in or working out what he wants to be done in our lives. So when we look at Deuteronomy 28, it says, and it shall come to pass. Look at this. If thou shall hearken or listen diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe. Now, this is what got me when I was looking at this. He says, if you would not just listen diligently, 
meaning I need you to do it intentionally. Listen to my voice. Learn my voice when I'm speaking to you. And then he says, not only that, but when you do, I need you to do it to observe. You should be looking at something and to do all. So not only do I need you to see it, but I need you to do it. Do not some of his commandments. The scripture says, and to do all his commandments. Look at this. Which I command you not yesterday, not remembering when, not, oh, you know, I remember. No, every single day that you open your eyes on this side of the earth, he says, I ask you to observe, be on the lookout, have a vision set before you. Not only that, do what I'm asking you to do. Every commandment, everything that I instruct you to do, everything with God comes with godly instructions. Half the time, we just don't want to pay attention to him because some of the things that he's asking us to do may not fit up or line up with what your agenda is. But when we do it God's way, God tells us exactly what we're supposed to do so we can get the desired result of the outcome of what we're asking for. So he says, if you would do all the commandments, which I command you this day, day by day, dear Lord, give us this day, our daily bread. How many of us grew up saying that prayer? Every day, there's a set of instructions. Every day, there's something different. And then he says, that the Lord your God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. How awesome is that? When God sets you up. <laughs> when God sets you up, nobody can take you down. And then he says, and all these blessings, here we go. Man, that thing right there just blessed me. Not a little bit of blessings, y'all. He said, all these blessings in plural. Come on, I wasn't no English major, but I know what that means. <laughs> and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. Not only are they going to come on you, it's, it's going to be so many blessings, it's going to overtake you. And if you would listen or hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shalt thou be in the city. Blessed thou shalt be in the field. It's not going to matter where you are, in or out, you are blessed. Glory to God. Blessed shall the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle and the increase of thine kind and thy flocks of thy sheep. Listen, no matter what you put your finger to do, cattle, sheep, all that was a, a, a form of currency because that's what they could trade or that's what they used to you know, crop their fields or whatever the case may be. But he says, look, not only is this stuff going to overtake you, no matter where you are, whether you in or out, you're going to be blessed. But I love it. He said, and shall be the fruit of thy body, your body, your health. How many of us need our health to be blessed? Come on. I mean, some of us are walking around. You know, I remember when I was unhealthy. I remember when all that weight was on me and I was about to die. Okay. Hitting at 300 pounds with my body frame. That was not healthy. And I was carrying the most of it in my midriff. I was on the brink of death more than 25 pills a day. Listen, that's not living. That's existing. And I was barely doing that. But when we are doing it God's way, God says, I will bless your body. I will bless the fruit of the ground. Everything that you sow. We've been talking about this. You said a part of our harvest means something has to be sown, whether it's your time, whether it's your money, whether it's your resources, whether it's, um, you know, your talents. He says, look, I give seed to the sower. So look at what God says. Not when you, not, not when you do it your way, but when you do it my way. I'm going to bless the fruit of the ground and the fruit of that cattle. So no matter what you put in the ground is blessed. It's going to yield its fruit. It's going to come right back up and give you exactly what you intended for it to come up. 
and to give you. And so he says, blessed shall thy be in thy basket and thy store, meaning in your house, your cupboard should never go empty. You know, even when I was without work and I didn't know how I was going to get things done or how to get things paid. Don't you know, our cupboards never went empty. Now I felt like the little woman that was standing there with the meal in the basket. He said, look, if you would just obey, this is what he, um, Elijah told the woman of God. He said, look, if you would just obey what the man of God is saying to you and go. She had prepared her little, she had gotten a meal, was getting ready to prepare her little cake for her and her son. And she said, look, man of God, I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to make this cake and me and my son going to eat this, uh, this little cake here and we going to die. Man of God said, I hear what you're saying, and I know it looks real bad, and I know you don't understand what's going on in your life right now and why things are drying up and why it looks like every time I'm trying to get ahead, my finances go left, right, south, east, northwest, and I can't ever get ahead of it. But the man of God told her, look, if you would obey and listen to what I'm saying to you, take what you have. Take the little cruise of oil that you have. Take that little meal that you have in there. What's left of it? Make a cake for me. Now, check out what he told her. Now, I want you to see how God will bless you when you, it's, it's, this is, can you just shout out, this is all about obedience right now. What we're talking about tonight, this is about obedience. And he told her, if you would just take what you have, that little cruise of oil, he said, make a cake for me first. And we've been talking about this in this series. Listen, everything you do, it starts with God, what? First. God first, always. So he said, make the man of God a cake first. You do, you do what you do normally, what you was getting ready to do. But before you and your son eat that and, and commence to go do what you said you're going to do and die, I'm telling you, make me a cake first. And she made him a cake first. And she, he said, now go and make one for you and your son. And in her mind, she was like, what are you talking about? I just told you the last of what I had. I just made for you. He said, okay, yeah. But you had enough faith to believe God to come and do and make the cake for me. Now go back and make one for you and your son. And when she went back, the Bible declared that she went back and there was more meal there. And there was more oil there. Why am I saying that? A part of your anointing is your oil. That's the oil you carry on your life. Just when you don't think you have any more. Just when you don't think you can give any more. Just when you think, I can't make it another minute. I can't do this no more in ministry. I'm flustered. I'm burnt out. I'm tired. Just when you are ready to throw in the towel, God says, I have anointed you. I've smeared so much oil on you. Just when you think you're about to tuck her out. Listen, there's so much oil on your life that I've given you more than enough that if you would go back, when you give to me first, when you give me the first fruits of your morning, when you give me the first fruits of your, your, your worship, when you give me the first fruits of your praise, when you give me the first fruits of your tithing, when you give me the first fruits of everything, I'm telling you today or tonight, whoever, however you're watching me today, I'm telling you, you have enough rubbed on the inside of you, enough anointing. Come on, rub yourselves until you start to see the oil come out. Listen, there's so much oil on you that you have what it takes. That's a blessing. That just bless my socks off. It lets me know that God is always with us. He said, greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. Listen, it doesn't matter how bad it gets. I'm telling you, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is so real. I've had too many times in my life when I did had I did not have a clue as to how me and my kids were going to get through this or make it. I didn't. When I left to go to Kentucky, I left with a car. I told you, packed to the brim with both my kids. Enough food. Probably lasted me for about a week and a couple of days stay in a hotel. That's what we left. North Carolina, Spring Lake, North Carolina, leaving my house, driving all the way to 
uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, from my first civilian government job as I retired out of the military with nothing. I was like, I don't know what in the world is going to happen. I'm sitting in a gas station. My kids are asleep. I'm bawling my eyes out. And the Holy Spirit says, your God mom still lives here. Call her. I call her. She sleepily wakes up, answers the phone. It's um, right at midnight. And she asked me where I was at. I didn't have no idea. I just looked on the side of the building of the the little gas station store I was in, total where I was at. She said, I'm less than five minutes from you. I was like, you are kidding me. She was like, no, I'm not. She got up, put her clothes on, got to her house, took me down in her basement. I told you guys, got down in her basement. There was two beds sitting there and dressers and all that stuff. And I'm thinking, whose room is I'm, am I about to take? And she said, nobody's. God had spoke to her two weeks earlier and told her to outfit that basement with beds. Don't tell me that God doesn't know your plans. The Bible says it this way. The steps of a good man, they're what? They're ordered by God. I did not even want to take the job in Kentucky, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. But God knew. God knew what he had set up. God knew what he had planned. He says, look, whether you're in the city, out the city, you're already blessed. I got you. Don't worry about it. You looking for the blessings, and I'm trying to tell you the blessings is going to run you down. Don't worry about that. Those blessings are going to come, and brother and sister, if you're hearing me today, it's going to come, and it's going to overtake you. He said, you're going to be so blessed that when thou comest in, or even when you go out, you're going to be blessed. This is the part I love. The Lord, not you, not your neighbor not your siblings. It said, the Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face, and they shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. Look at that. Listen, stop trying to fight your haters. I love my haters. If you watch it tonight, I love you. <laughs> I know that's probably tripping somebody out for me to say that, but I'm so serious. You know why I say I love them? Because you keep me sharp. You keep me on my knees. You keep me on my toes. I love each and every one of you. You know why? Because he says, I'll give thy enemies to be thy footstool. Listen, the only way you can get up is you got to be able to stand up on something. So thank you for giving me your back. Thank you for giving me your leg to stand up on. I appreciate you. I appreciate you so very much. There's nothing anyone out there can say or do that can stop the blessings of God on your life. Do you not realize that we spend so much energy and we spend so much time in this one and that one, we fussing and going back and forth with people like elementary students. Listen, they don't have to do that. You don't even have to belittle anybody or make people feel small just so you feel bigger. You understand what I'm saying? That's not necessary. Why? Because there's a bullseye on your back, baby. It doesn't matter how dark situations in life around you may be, or even the ones that try to do it intentionally. He says, listen, I'm not worried about that. I bless you. When you were born, you weren't born with a rattle in your hand. You were born with a sickle. You are a reaper in this revolutionary end time remnant army and God saves the best for last. We're going to reap everything that all our forefathers have sown into the fields. So you got to get in the field and they are white. The Bible said in John chapter four, verse 35, that the fields are white and ready for harvest. How do I reap? my harvest. I'm glad you asked. The first thing that you have to do to reap your harvest is you have to send forth your angels according to Hebrews 1 and 14. So let's look at that. Hebrews 1 and 14. You have to call forth your angels according to Hebrews. So let's see what Hebrews had said about that. All right. 
Hebrews 1 and 14. So let's look at what it says. It says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? They are waiting on the release of the words of your mouth to go and get what you need. Okay, I'm going to say that again because somebody missed that. There are ministering angels waiting on a word from God to go and get what you need. There are things such as healing, salvation, and deliverance that you have sown for years and years and years, and you've yet to see the reaping of it. A part of your harvest is implored your ministering angels. Even the Bible said when Jesus was up um, in the wilderness, what came and ministered to him? Angels. The Bible says he could have said something to the angels the whole time he was up there and they could have went on ahead and, and delivered him from up there while he was having this discussion between him and the devil. But the Bible said he didn't do all that. He was like, no, I'm just going to fight the devil with the word. And the Bible says after he had done given him the word, the Bible says, and he left him for a season. If you give the devil the word, he will do the same thing to you. The Bible, the Bible said you would if you would stand firm and you would not uh and resist him, don't give in to him. He said he will flee from you. And we just read, don't worry about your enemies, because they're gonna come in one way, but the Bible said they're gonna go out seven. Listen, I don't care how you got up in here, but you're gonna flee. You're gonna get away from me with all that craziness. And so he says, look, I've given you ministering angels, but you ain't said nothing. When was the last time you talked to the angels? When was the last time you put them on a, on a mission to do God's word and God's will in your life? There are things that we are yet to reap. The number two thing, you need to prophesy your harvest in. I'm going to say that again. Number two, you need to prophesy your harvest in. Now let's look at that in Revelations 19. Come on, we're going we, we in this Bible today. Revelations 19. How do we do that? You need to call it in. Prophesy to it. He has given us these things, but we don't activate them. We don't talk about these things. It says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. This is um, Revelations 19, verse 10. It says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So your second thing is prophesy. It was spoken words that brought Jesus out of the tomb. David said, you would not suffer me to see death, neither would I leave my soul in hell. And that could be found in Psalm 16 and 10. He told the disciples, even before they were disciples, come and I will make you what? Fishers of men. That's exactly what he told the disciples. God is intent on making you into that which he wants you to be. That he wants you to be. He wants to make you the righteousness of of God in Christ Jesus. The Bible declares there's nothing right within us. There's no good thing. There's no right thing within us. It says we are as but filthy rags. We don't have a right. We don't have no entitlement. We don't have nothing that we should be just granted all this greatness that we have in our sinful nature. We don't. But God, when we came, gave our lives to Christ, he says you became the sons of God. In that son not being a respecter of gender, you're the sons of God. You're the sons and the daughters of God. I have made you the righteousness of, of God. Not within yourself, the Bible says, but in Christ Jesus. When God sees us, he don't see you. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he sees. That's why we are covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. When God looks at us, if it was just us, 
that all God see would, would see would, would be our filthiness, our haughtiness, our attitudes, our everything that makes that would probably make him sick to his stomach. All of our sin. But our sins was covered by the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary for you and I. So his word declared that yet have I not seen the righteous, even though there's nothing about me that's righteous. I'm going to use myself. I ain't going to talk about y'all. I'm going to talk about me. Although I am not righteous, he said, but I have never seen because I am the redeemed of God. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread psalm 37 and 25 in fact the bible declares that god said you would supply the seed for the sowing and the bread for the eating in isaiah 55 and 10 so god never intends for us or his church to have a begging mentality. I'm going to say that one more time because I get so nauseated when I go and I set the minister at these churches and all you got to do is stand up like you begging the people to give. Wait a minute. I didn't read that. No way in the Bible. Nowhere have we read that in the Bible. That we had to beg or scheme people. Are you listening to me tonight or today? I hope this is blessing you. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we need to beg or scheme people out of their finances. I hope you're hearing me real good on that one. So we don't have a begging spirit. We don't have a begging mentality. We're not a missionary bail mentality or we're not barely getting by mentality. You know, I get sick of asking the saints, how are you today? Oh, I'm making it. I'm getting by. No, you are more than that. I had to rebuke myself for doing stuff like that. No, you are what you say. And you shall have what you say. No, I am the blessed and the highly favored of the Lord. How are you today? That's not trying to be over spiritual or just too churchy. No, I'm blessed. How are you? It ain't got to be all extra. How are you today? I'm blessed. I'm on this side of the fence. Today is a good day. <laughs> I'm blessed. You're blessed. So he doesn't want us to walk around wishing we could find the ends, much less make them meet mentality. No, I'm not trying to make my ends meet. My ends have already been met. Now, what I've been um, to, to do it or have I been a great steward over what the Lord has put in my auspice? That's a whole nother discussion. Me and my children were just having this conversation. I told them, no, we have to be good stewards. We have to be good stewards over everything, managing our time, managing our finances, managing our bodies, managing whatever. Are you a good steward? Can I make you a manager or a supervisor over the things that God has given you? The Bible says, if excuse me, if you're faithful over those few things, I will what? Make you ruler over much. How can God bless us? How can we go and reap our harvest if we can't be faithful over the few? If God gave you a hundred dollars and all he asked you for was 10, but and you asking God for the thousands and the millions, but you won't even get ten dollars, you won't even take that beautiful luxury Volvo that you have and give someone a ride downtown because you're worried about whether or not they're gonna stink up your seats or they're gonna you know, drop a crumb on your floor. We have to be good stewards. God didn't bless us with all that stuff or all these things that we're reading about according to Deuteronomy just for fashion or just to be flaunted. No, you're blessed to be a blessing. I remember when I first had my Volvo S40 when I was stationed in Vilsack, Germany. I don't even think my car was four days old and it already had green beans you slapped all around the back seat because he was having a thing or a function at the church. And I had to transport the food. And I guess I hit a bump too hard. And by the time we opened up the trunk, I had green bean juice everywhere. I was like livid. And you know what God said to me? He said, it's a car to Vita. You get a towel and you can wipe that out. It's okay. I mean, I was really upset, y'all. But he rebuked me like instantly. He was like, that can be cleaned up. What are you tripping out about? 
The real thing is, okay, it's a car. It depreciated its value by thousands the second you drove it off the lot. What are you tripping off of? <laughs> we make a mountain out of a molehill, guys. So we don't have to worry about that stuff. It is just that. So if God could give me that car, why am I tripping? Because he can give me another one. Okay. It's okay. We don't have to worry about that stuff. All right. Those are just what they are. They're things. He says, all these things shall be added unto you. When we seek ye first the kingdom of God, that's the scripture, Matthew 6, 33. When we seek ye first the kingdom of God, I uh, hope somebody's catching this. Every time we put God first, when we seek, 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 diligent, go after, listen, when you go after God first, always giving and acknowledging God first. When you do everything first with God, the Bible says when you seek God diligently, if you seek the kingdom of God, when you seek the things of God first and all his righteousness, I just explained to you, there's nothing righteous within us. There's nothing. He said everything righteous within us is 50 rags. You, you know, I used to tell my, you know, I used to tell my church when I said the priest is, you know, type of stuff. I would tell them, look at your neighbor and say, you ain't nobody. <laughs> you ain't nobody. So we make ourselves, you know, the Bible said we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. You know, sometimes we just get above ourselves. We get real bougie when we come into a few things. You come into some more money. You come into a better house. You come into better clothing. And all of a sudden we're so bougie. <laughs> oh, I don't do that. What happened? What happened to the fun? You know, that's what I love about kids. And I think that's why God loves kids. God always says, suffer not the little children to come unto me. Don't, don't worry about that. They have a pure innocence that I love. You know, before y'all got all dignified and all sanctified and all bougie, you know, I love the kids because you know what? Kids are so carefree. They really are. They they really help bring me back down to earth. I love kids. <laughs> Maybe that's why I love my job when I was teaching so much. Kids keep you grounded because kids are so innocent. They're innocent in their thoughts. They're innocent in everything they do, but they're very bold. They're very honest. I love it. I love everything about that age group that I used to teach from three to five because they would tell me, Miss Smith, we don't like your hair like that today. Or Miss Smith, I don't like that dress. That dress make you look fat. You know, I used to be like, well, dang, you know what? Well, thank y'all so so very much, kids. <laughs> you know, but I couldn't even be mad at them because they were just speaking their truth. And that's how they saw stuff. It was innocent. It wasn't fabricated. I loved it, you know. And I come in and, you know, I had a little boy. Oh, I like that cologne. This must really nice, you know. They were just very honest. When did we stop being that? We, we need to be like the kid. That's why he said, when you come to me, come to me as a little child. Come to God. I don't know everything, God. I don't even understand what's going on in this season in my life. I need you to help me through this. The same way a child asks for help, why can't we not humble ourselves and ask for help as adults? We don't know everything. I don't even understand all the seasons and all the, all the things and uh, you know, myriad of things, you know, the vicissitudes that happen in life that, you know, take us by storm sometimes. But sometimes you have to humble yourself and say, God, I don't understand. How do I get the rest of this harvest? What am I doing wrong? Did I plan in the wrong season? Did I pull up when I should have let it stay? You know, these are the, the innocent things as children of God, we forget to be childlike with. You got to sometimes go back to the drawing board, people. You got to go back to the person that created you, that knows every step of what you're going to do. So he never intended for us to beg. He never intended us for be the barely getting by. He never intended us for us to be sitting there having to live paycheck to paycheck, month to month. Come on. That's not how God intended for us to live. He said we live in abundance because he is an abundance everlasting, overflowing, more than enough God. 
The Bible says that God is so much that the that there's no compound. There's nothing that can get around him. There's nothing that can get over him. There's nothing that can come under him because there's so much God. There's not enough room to try to contain all of who he is. So if we serve a big, 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 big God like that, who knows anyone that has a big God like that, but we like to put him in this little itty bitty box. Be it our mentality, be it our attitudes, be it whatever it's going to be. God never intended for us to be like that. So this is what I want to post to you as we get ready to bring this to a close. There is a revelation that has to come to the body of Christ, which is leading us from the back of the bus. And that's going to move us to the front where we're going to take control. Come on, say that out loud to yourself take control it is the revelation that is there in this threefold harvest we're going to take control of ourselves spiritually we're going to take our control of ourselves physically and we're going to take control of ourselves financially for all who will learn to operate in the truth of faith that we're going to share in these next few segments i want you to understand three um um third john um, uh, the uh, third chapter of John, I mean, third book of John, chapter two says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in every way and that your body may keep well, even as I know your soul keeps well and pro prospers. That's in the Amplified version. It says, How long will you continue? This is the question. How long will you continue to believe scriptures like this are for somebody else and not for you? How long will you continue to believe, oh, that's great for them, but that doesn't apply to me? How long will you continue to rejoice and be happy for somebody else's miracle, but can't believe God for your own? Come on. These are valid questions. How long? How long until you would turn your hands heavenward and begin to take God at his word and faith believing that you can receive it as your own? Hebrews 11 and 1 says, now faith, not some other time, not when it's convenient. Now faith, it is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things that we hope for. What are you hoping for in your heart? What's the proof of the things of the evidence that you cannot see and the conviction of the reality? Your faith that's perceiving as a real fact that we have not revealed in the senses. Listen, I'm telling you, it is now time to act on it individually for yourselves and for your household. As we get ready to grab our harvest, I want you to understand this is a personal um, thing today. I want you to take this word by the horns and this is for yourself and this is for your household, your family. Listen, faith will take the promise of your future, which was given in your past and make your harvest manifest in your present. I'm going to say that one more time. Faith. Faith is an action word. We say we got to put some action to this thing. Faith would take the promise that's in your heart of your future, what it is that you said you've seen, what it is that God has shown you great about your future, which was given to you in the past. I told you, whatever it is that you're going to be, God already knew it. And then you're going to make your harvest manifest in your present because God says this day you shall be blessed. It's a this day kind of thing. This is a this day kind of word. Whatever it is that you're hoping for, whatever you're believing God for, if you will believe and trust in the faith of God's word, I promise you this, the thing that you are looking for in your harvest is going to manifest right before your very eyes. I love you guys. I appreciate you. When you join us on next Thursday, we're going to be talking about our seed of faith. What is it that we got to plant in this faith thing that's going to bring about the rest of our harvest? 
So I hope you've enjoyed this today or tonight, whichever time or um, area you are viewing me from. I love each and every one of you. I hope you have a glorious rest of your week. Again, thank God for CC's report. Thank God for her father. We're going to continue. Continue to be in prayer one for another. Love on somebody. Hug on somebody. Let them know that Jesus in you is real. So until we come back together again, I love you. Peace out.